the question, sir, uh, it's okay if you uh, talk with us. I want to know uh, why uh, is there such thing as Creation Ministries International? Uh, what's the purpose of uh, you know creationism? You know, how is it so relevant, and why is it why it should be relevant today? Yeah, good good question. So. Yes, yeah, so it's good. CMI is the acronym our organization goes by, but it's Creation Ministries International. Um, now there's a few other organizations similar to us, and they really, really have the same view. And, and what we're trying to tell the church and the world is that Genesis is history. Um, mm. Now, it's written as history, and that's a really interesting thing because maybe we can get onto this later. The people that don't believe it's true, recognize it's written as history, either Hebrew scholars um, that don't believe it's true, recognize it as history. But we're living in an age now where a lot of the church is saying, hmm, maybe it's not history. Maybe science has shown that the Genesis account cannot be history. So people think, hey, if I'm going to be a rational person, if I'm going to be an intellectual uh, person, then I cannot take Genesis as history and I have to have some kind of compromise. And so, yeah, we really exist to tell the church and the world that you um, don't need to make that compromise. You should not make that compromise. And actually, there's no experimental evidence. There's no empirical science that shows that you should you cannot take um, Genesis as history just as it's written. Yes, uh, Genesis is history. That's one of the, um, that's the main uh, argument of, uh, of creationists. Yeah, of course. Um, it's not only creationism that uh, that covers here, because uh, what fascinates me uh, as a young thinker during my high school years, it's not only evolution that is uh, that opposes creationism. Even an, even in the Christian theology, even in the Christian origin uh, origin story, there are other uh, isms as well, like these evolution, uh, old earth creationism, which is a uh, you know which has to bring some curiosity and uh, interesting questions out of the mind of a thinker. So um yeah yeah so uh, you uh, I'll, I'll just I'll just say Paul quickly I think it's important to work so the people that are on your channel maybe they've heard a few of these different points of view of Genesis and I'd just like to encourage everyone it's important to think these things through um, and in fact maybe we get time for this later but there's actually big theological implications and um, it's even to do with the gospel uh, as to how we take Genesis. And so I think I'd want to encourage anyone, for any young thinkers out there that are Christians, like think through these issues because they're really important and, they, and they're a foundation for you to build on. Just like Jesus said, you're going to build your foundation on the sand or the stone. And it, stone takes a lot longer to build on stone. And so it's worth, it seems like a lot of time, a lot of effort to think through creation, evolution, young, old earth. But it's really worth it, I think, because you, if you're, especially as you're saying, you're young thinkers, you've got many years ahead of you. Um, if you build a strong foundation now and the foundation, really the beginning is the place to start. The beginning and the end are important. And the cross, of course, is ultimately important in the middle. But um, building a strong foundation, it's worth spending the time. I grew up in a non-Christian home. At 18 years old, I encountered Jesus and I knew he was real. I couldn't deny it. Um, and then I went to university straight after that. And whilst at university, I joined the Christian Union Club there. And they said, and I was very f um, passionate about evangelism because I realized, hang on, eternity is real. Heaven is real. Hell is real. I want I don't want people to go to hell. I want people to be with God forever. So I was very passionate about evangelism. Um, and so I listened quite carefully when they said, listen, don't talk about creation and evolution because it gets a bit complicated and it, it's not very fruitful. It doesn't lead people to Christ. Um, so I thought, well, I've just got to avoid that issue. Um, and it wasn't until 15 years later, I was uh, changing jobs and I was going for a job interview uh, with a large medical company called Abbott. And I found out that I didn't want that job because it was in a place that I didn't want to move to. So I said no. And I walked out of the door and I saw a sign, Creation Ministries International. And I'd heard of the organization and I thought, I really want to go to one of their talks. So I walked in the door and I said, look, um, do you, because I thought while I'm here and I've traveled to go to this interview, I don't want the job. I may as well talk to this organization I've heard of and I want to know more about. So I knocked on the door and I went in and they let me in, which is quite amazing because I, I just said, hey, look, I've got a, a background in geophysics. Do you employ a geologist? I'd love to sit down and have a chat because I just thought I've never, I haven't spent a lot of time looking into this issue because I was 
dissuaded 15 years earlier not to look into the issue. I was told it's bad for evangelism. To, you know, if it's bad for evangelism, well, what's the point? I may as well spend my efforts learning something else or using different ways to bring people to the Lord. Anyway, I, I, I walked in and I sat down with my now colleague, Dr. Taz Walker, a geologist at Creation Ministries, and we, we chatted for about an hour, an hour and a half. And I looked around the room and saw that um, he he was doing various study. And I thought, oh, this would be quite a good job to have. I said, what's it like to work here? I wasn't thinking I would end up working there, but we just got chatting. And then a few months later, I met a lot of the other people there. And then I decided, oh, this is this is what I should be doing. And since then, I've found out the importance of the issue, the relevance to the gospel. And I've actually found it the most amazing evangelism tool ever. <laughs> it's uh, it's incredible because you can talk. Everyone wants to talk about is interested in talking about science. Um, and it's not so abrupt as, OK, often sometimes I ask people that I randomly, where are you going when you die? It's quite an abrupt question. And some people, you know, the conversation ends there. But everyone is interested to talk about science, like the latest um, exoplanet finding or maybe something about evolution or maybe something about design in the world you know just the latest science subject you can start talking about that and actually that ends up leading to the cross and leading to Jesus and all it takes is a little bit of knowledge and a little bit of research so after about three four months of intense reading before I, my job started um, I ended up using it in evangelism and thought gosh I really wish I knew this 15 years earlier uh, so it's basically uh, a combination of both being a thinker and a faith uh, carrier. I mean, it's, uh, it's not only putting your faith in Christ that uh, that makes you a different, a transformed person, but the evidence for the faith. I mean, the the the, the research, everything, the intelligence, the science, uh, all leading to the cross, or all leading to all proving, uh, rather, uh, Christianity as uh, as the, the veracity of it. So just to say a question again, Carl, is it, are you asking how should we approach um, the text of Genesis or how should we approach science? Well, can you just say it again? Yeah, uh, I mean, th those, those uh, theories of, uh, of, of our origins, like uh, evolution and also within Christianity, theistic evolution, uh, which I believe it also includes the interpretation of scriptures in Genesis. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of really a, a broad thing, but in a simplified form, how can we... How can we Christians, a simple layman, uh, approach yeah. this um, var variety? Yes, so that's, a, that's a good question. So as a Christian, first of all, um, we need to, it's really important to understand that the Bible is truth, that it's not just a normal book, it's a miraculous book, and that um, God has intended for us to have it in our hands. And that, yes, it was written by men, but it says it was God-breathed, that it's a miraculous book. And therefore, if that's true, uh, then as a Christian, we need to settle in our mind that the Bible is inherent and it's also infallible. Uh, therefore, every, everything it says, because um, we often hear this phrase, you might have heard this phrase, oh, the Bible's not a science book. Sometimes you hear the Bible, Bible's not a history book. And, you know, in some places it's not. Some places it's poetry. In some places it's history. Some places... Anyway, but the point is, it, it doesn't matter um, what genre you are reading. Um, when you're reading the Bible, you know that it's true. Like it can't tell a lie because God's not a man that he can lie, right? So there's no lies in there. There's nothing that's false. And, th and that's really an amazing thing that there's nothing in experimental or provable science that would say a statement in the Bible is false. There's nothing in logic. There's nothing in reason, nothing in history. It's actually verifiable all the way down. But anyway, so as a Christian, if you're approaching the subject of origins, uh, then really you've got to take the Bible as your main text. That's your starting point. Yes, uh, you can explore the natural world, employing scientific methods to tell you more about how God created the world. But the um, your foundational text is the Bible because you know that's true. Um, there's a lot of other things we can prove that are true. Uh, but in terms of history and how it started, well, the Bible's got to be the first text. But first of all, I think for, for some people, they haven't yet established that the Bible is inerrant and infallible. And I think that's a very important uh, point if you're going on the journey with Christ if you're going to survive the journey if you're going to reach the end and and you're going to hear the Lord say well done good and faithful servant we really need the word of God um, and we need to understand that it's infallible and inerrant here's my here's the issue I found also uh Mr. Scott is if if, if there are there scientists who are Christians also right if they're Christians and they view the Bible as inerrant and infallible also how come they have a different interpretation 
How come there are okay. scientists who, you know, how come they, they interpret Genesis as like, like for example, the day age theory, wherein uh, each day of the creation is, is a particular age or a gap theory in between days, you know, there are six, there's seven days, well, six days of creation, seven days got rested. But in between mm. those days, there's a period of time. Mm. Uh, just by looking at those, those couple of theories, there, there are many more on that. Uh, even Jews have different interpretations of them. How come, how come that's, that's so? How come, uh, how come there, there's so much, there's so much uh, you know, difficulty of unifying both uh, worldviews? Yeah, good question. I want to answer that. I'll just make a quick comment on something you said. You said even Jews have different theories. So, and yeah, I think some modern Jews, they're not taking um, Genesis's history, but, but I, I would say a lot do. And if you actually look at some Jewish newspapers, uh, some of them still print the year and it's 5779 or something like this. So it's like, that's the amount of years since the, the beginning, since God created the world. Um, so I, I think it depends where you look, but, but yeah, sorry, sorry to get to your main question. How do people, they say, look, I believe the Bible's inerrant. I believe it's infallible. Um, and yeah, they say that, but then they have these different views of Genesis. So how, how, how do they manage that? It's a really good question. And so, and basically it comes down to, I think the topic of the, talk or the Q&A is, is Genesis history. And so what, what happens is they look at the text and they try and say, well, it's poetry or it's allegory. And they try and fit it in, into that thing, um, into, into a different realm. Because, you know, when we read the Psalms and, and when Jesus says, hey, you're sheep and I'm the shepherd, we know that um, that's metaphorical. We know that we're not physically yeah. sheep. Or we know that his, mm -hmm. And so there are parts in the bible that are metaphorical that are um poetry and they try and say genesis is as well and they're doing that because they're coming at the text with a presupposition that is not a biblical worldview presupposition they're coming at the text with a naturalistic presupposition and whether they know that or not is questionable i think a lot of them don't know that i think a lot of the time because look there's a lot more clever people than me um there's if you heard of francis collins He's a very famous, he's probably the most famous scientist. The genome world. project. He's, yeah, uh, yeah. The, he was the head of the genome project. Um, now he's the head of, I think it's NHI. It's basically the medical body of the United States, the medical research body. He's the head of that. Um, he's won the Templeton Prize. He's wrote a book called uh, the, the Language of God, which is... Language of God, yeah. He, yeah, he's, he's a theistic evolutionist. He is probably the most famous scientist. Now, I'd say he is a lot cleverer than me, especially when you look at uh, things to do with genetics. But when I listen to him talk, I see the presupposition of naturalism there. And I, look, I think some, so for some people, it's they don't, they have a presupposition of naturalism. And so, by the way, I just talked about the presupposition of naturalism means that there's no supernatural, right? So, because naturalism oh, yeah. is a philosophy that says only natural processes exist. Now, this is a very good philosophy for doing experimental science, for doing here and now science, the science that you can test and prove and repeat. So that's the type of science that follows the scientific method. You, you come up with a hypothesis, you test it, and you get a result. And then you can repeat it again and get the same result. And in fact, you could do the t experiment in the Philippines, I could do the experiment in Australia, and we get the same result. Something like water boiling at 100 centigrade whilst we're at sea level. You could go down to the sea level, boil water, find that it starts, um, boil, the boiling point is at 100 centigrade, and I would find the same thing. And if we did that 100 years in the past, we'd find the same thing. If we did that 500 years in the future, we'd find the same result. And so that, uh, we, use the, we use naturalism to understand how that works. Uh, we just employ natural processes. We don't think, oh, there was a supernatural event and God made the water boil all of a sudden. Um, yes, God is able to do that. <laughs> and we know supernatural events occur through history because we read it in the Bible and, and we can see it. But um, on the whole, God is a consistent God and he has made natural laws that will keep going and they'll keep going in the same way. And the very fact that modern science has even flourished is a result of Christianity, because Christianity in the Bible, we hear of a consistent God, a law. He's not a capricious God. He's not like one of the Hindu gods that gets up angry and then throws a bolt of lightning or one of the Greek gods. You know, it's not it, there's he's consistent. And therefore, the whole reason science flourished in the Middle Ages was because they had a Christian worldview that they believed that if they investigate the natural world, they should find consistent laws. Now, this is all experimental science, and that's a very good 
um, philosophy for discovering new things and doing experiments. But that's not a good philosophy. It's not a good type of science for deciding what happened in the past. Because, especially if you're a Christian, because we believe the world was created supernaturally, that it wasn't natural processes, right? So if you go into it with a naturalistic philosophy, you're going to start thinking that these natural processes have always happened all the way back. And you're and naturalism, no supernatural allowed. Um, and you know, this is even prophesied, actually, Carl. In 2 Peter 3, at the beginning, it says, in the last days, scoffers will come, saying, where is the coming of the Lord Jesus? Um, haven't things always been going on the same as since when our fathers died? But they forget this one thing. The one, God created the world through water. And two, God flooded the world with water, deluged the world with water. So they forget two things. They forget one, the supernatural creation, and they forget two, the flood. Now, if you introduce those two facts into science, you'll suddenly find that geology matches up, biology matches up, all the, everything matches up with what you see. But if you forget those two things, um, i.e. naturalism, because what, what they had there was they said everything's been going on the same as it always has. And I'd love to talk about a word called uniformitarianism. I don't know if you've heard that, but, but that's basically everything going on the same as it already has. So this is 2000 year old prophecy. It's come true in the last 200 years. And now we have great thinkers, great um, theistic evolutionists that are, they love God, they're, they're Christians, um, but they have this philosophy of naturalism embedded in them, embedded in their teaching, because they forgot that two things, God created the world out of water and God flooded the world with water. And they just have naturalism. Um, now, I think there's other things that are going on there. Some, sometimes there's peer pressure. Um, they want to. They don't want to look intellectually stupid. <laughs> really, it, it's it's quite a intellectual sacrifice to say, "Hey, I'm a I'm a creationist. I'm a biblical creationist. I believe what the Bible says." Really, that doesn't go well, and you will get thrown out of universities. You get thrown out of educational systems when you make that kind of statement. So, so that's the other thing. Um, uh, sorry, it's a long answer. Do you maybe you want to pick yeah. that apart? Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah, I mean, uh, I like what you said in the last part because it's, I think even I mean, scientists are not objective people. They're, they're emotional people. Uh, they, they tend to be driven by their own emotions, inertia, and their allurement to mathematics, allurement to the old paradigm. So that's what I've been noticing as well as one of the, I believe, that's, uh, that's one of the uh, things that keeps, that, uh, keeps scientists, uh, maintains them in their old uh, state uh, um, don't know they cannot adapt they can't even start to get out of their box but i, I want to focus more on presupposition sir it's very important you said that uh mm -hmm. you you said that um the reason why these scientists have the, the various interpretations is because of the fact that they have presupposition the reason why there's theistic evolution there's evolution is because they believe in the philosophy of naturalism okay so yeah. shifting now that presupposition shifting it now to that the idea that this world is supernaturally created by god now account that the six or the seven days are literal 24 hours or as a young earth sir um well it's not a young earth because it's six thousand years right that's the that's the assumption it's like a, or or about more or less that, uh, that period it's actually old yeah thousands of years how can uh how can uh, for a layman christian for a common christian to read the genesis how can uh how can we immediately like be convinced ah this is a literal day this a literal 24 hour day or um, if it's not a day, then what is it? If it's <laughs> what, what period of time? Mm. So, so, so it's a good question. I, I would flip that around, Carl. And I would say, um, why did God take so long? Why did he take six days to create the world? Like, why did he not do it in one second? He created in two nanoseconds, right? <laughs> Yeah, why did he not do it in a few nanoseconds? Good, yeah. Uh, yeah. And and so and, and I think that's a really interesting question because so so actually because what I heard you say was some people might be asking what how did God manage to do it in six days? Like how did that happen? But then if you think about it, like God, God is God, and like He can do it in a nanosecond, He can do it in a picosecond. <laughs> he could do it when our clocks wouldn't even have time to be able to measure it. Um, he's a supernatural creator and he supernaturally made the world and he took six days to do it. But why did he take so long? The question I was posing, why did God take six days? And so just scripturally, when we look at it um, in Exodus 20, 11, uh, God, right. This is God's writing. It's not Moses's writing, right? You know, when Moses receives the tablet, um, not the iPad, the, the tablet of stone. Sorry, it's a poor joke. But anyway, he receives the tablet of stone and inscribed on it is the Ten Commandments. And at that time, there was the Sabbath keeping commandment. And it says, 
you shall work six days and rest on the seventh because God made the world in six days and rested on the seventh. So you shall do likewise. So the answer to the question is why did God take six days is because he did it as a pattern because he wanted us to follow it. Um, and this is really interesting. And I, I, without getting into the theology of whether you keep the Sabbath now or not, whether it's a New Testament thing or not. And um, the point is God actually throughout history, uh, people have found that the week is the best thing to use. Now, if you think about this, Carl, I'll, I'll, I'll come to answer your question in a minute, but I just want to make this point because I think it's interesting is uh, I'll ask you, how do you know when one day occurs? How do you know when a day is finished or it occurs? Or how do we know the length of a day? Yeah, um, I, I don't know if it's already a day, if, it, if there's uh, a morning and an evening. Right? Is, is there, is yeah, the a, earth spins, right? There, so there, in yeah. one day, you get one full rotation of the earth. Okay, what about a month? Yeah, if it's uh, 30 days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so a month. But the reason we know how long a month is, is because it it's, comes from a moon. Moon. It's the moon. The moon takes about 28 or 29 days. And actually, we've slightly altered the month in more modern times. But originally, it was the moon rotating around the Earth. And then, okay, finally, an easy one, the year. How long does, how do we know how long a year takes? Uh, a full revolution around the sun. Yeah, exactly. So what I'm saying is you've got day, you've got year, and they're all told, they, we know how long they take by celestial objects. We know because of what, when we look at the sky, we see things happening time and time again. The moon keeps going around, the earth keeps going around the sun, and the sun, earth keeps spinning. And they happen consistently like that. And therefore, we can mark our time on these things. But then I'd ask you the same question about the week. And you would, I would say, what kind of astronomical object tells you when a week is up? And you'd have to conclude that there is none. So the, where does the week come from? Well, the origin of the week is God, God making the world in six days and resting on the seventh. And therefore, he told the Israelites to do the same. It's a Jewish thing. The week, and some secular historians will try and argue that it's Greek, but um, I've got some good papers that can show you this is a Hebrew thing, uh, the week. So God created the week. And you know what we've tested? We've tried five days. We've tried 10 days. The Russians a few hundred years ago, I think they were tried is it five a five day week. Um, the seven day week is the week that works the best. Um, it's, it's almost like we were designed to work a certain number of days and rest on another day. So, so that's really interesting that God took six days. <laughs> but just to move on to your, to answer your question about um, why? Uh, uh, so the, what your question was, theistic evolutionists take it as long ages and they try and use the word yom, right? And they say, OK, yom could be a long day. So when you look at the Hebrew um, and you look at yom, you've got to also look at the context, right? And it says uh, there was day one um, and then there was evening and then there was morning, the second day. So there's lots of data points here that are not just day. So you look at the context. It's a bit like in the English language, you could say, in my father's day, it took seven days to drive from, so Brisbane to Melbourne. Um, and so I'm picking cities in Australia. So there's two different words that are used day there. In my father's day. Now we understand that in English, that that doesn't mean a 24 hour day. That means a period of time, a long time ago, right? In my father's day. Have you heard that expression before? In my father's day. So I just read things. Okay. Happy Father's Day. <laughs> happy Father's Day. Oh, yeah. Father's. Happy Father's Day. We know that's a day. If you say on Father's Day, and but and and then I said it took seven days to drive from Brisbane to Melbourne. Now, how many? You'd interpret that as twenty-four hours. Seven twenty-four hours. Now, sometimes you, uh, you could say during the daytime or in the day when it was light. Now, by the context, you know that that's probably more like a 12 hour from sunrise to sunset. So there's different periods of use. So in my father's day means a long time ago, means maybe 40 years ago in my father's day when my father was young and growing up. Um, and then there's the 24 hour day. It took seven days for me to drive from Brisbane to Melbourne. And then there's the in the day, during the day, which means more like 12 hours or depending, you know, whether it's summer or winter. So it's three different examples of what, how you could use the word day. But the thing that defines the correct use is the language around it, is the context. 
if I take it, if I say it took seven 24 hour periods, or if it, it took seven days to travel, you know what that means. You don't think, oh, seven, it took seven days for him to go from Brisbane to Melbourne. Maybe he means 7 million years. No, you don't think that because of the context mm -hmm. uh, it, in his father's day. That's saying, and I'm not sure how well that translates because obviously English isn't your first language and maybe you don't have that term in the father's day. Do you have that? Do you, do you use that term um, in, in your mother tongue as well? In my father's day, have you heard of that? Uh, usually I use the term like uh, during the time of my dad, during his time. You know, it's, yeah. Usually I said that, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, you've got the same phrase, but you in English, we there's a... Um, it, the phrase we use is in my father's day. So we use the word day, but we don't mean 24 hour day. And so, yeah. so what I'm agreeing with, um, maybe, I, maybe I'm slightly agreeing with theistic evolutionists there by saying day can mean many things, but the Bible has context, right? It says day one, there was evening, there was morning, day two, there was evening, there was morning, day three, there was evening, there was morning. And if you read Genesis one, just have a look at it. There's always evening, morning, there's always, and it numbers the days. Now, this same kind of structure can be found elsewhere in Genesis. And every time you find day mentioned with a number and with evening and morning, no one else ever tries to interpret it as millions of years. It's always day. It's always 24 hour day. Um, and, and that makes sense from the context. So you're really trying to stretch it when you say that, OK, this day might mean thousands or millions of years. It's not. I mean, you could say to someone, well, why is the week? Why, you know, maybe God intended us to work for six million years and then rest on the seventh million year. Because yeah, that's what it says in Exodus 20, 11. Mm, yeah. So there's a lot of, a lot of problems with it. And if you just take it very plainly as it's written, you see, you say, OK, well, that's that's six days. Um, and it's very hard to uh, try and say it's longer periods. It doesn't really work. Fair enough. That's very clear. Yeah, I like, I like your point. You said it's uh, context is crucial. Presuppositions are crucial. Um, local flood's an interesting one because so often people use local flood because they don't want to accept um, a global flood is uh, makes sense of Genesis one to eleven as history, whereas a local flood uh, they want to compromise there. So the interesting thing about local flood is if it was a local flood. And what does God promise at the end of the flood? He says, he puts a rainbow in the sky and says, I promise I will never flood the world again. And you, say, and you think, well, hang on. Has there been local floods? Um, think about the tsunami in 2004, killed 250,000 people on the coast of Indonesia. Like, that's, that's a big flood. <laughs> um, so, and that's a local flood. But so what God was promising there, he was promising I will never flood the whole world again. Um, so has God kept his promise or not? Was it a local flood or was it a global flood? If it was a global flood, then God's kept his promise. If it was a, lo if it was a local flood, then God has not kept his promise because there's been a number of local floods since. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's a lot of uh, good geological evidence to say it was global as well in terms of transcontinental sedimentary structures that are the same throughout uh, different continents. And you think, well, how else would you create that kind of structure without a global flood? And yeah, the Bible says every mountain top, every mountain top was covered. Uh, to, I think it was 15 cubits above the highest point. So if you think about that, if you've got a mountain top and you've got 15 cubits, and I think that's translate, is it three meters a cubit? I can't remember at the moment. But anyway, it's above the highest mountain top. Now, if you've got a local flood and you've got water above the highest point um, of that local part, then why would it not flood over into the next part? Does that make sense? So the local floods here. <laughs> Um, and if it's below the mountain, it has to be below different mountain tops to have a local flood, right? You have to have a valley, yeah. um, and it might be more complicated than this. But anyway, there's two points where it doesn't flow over. But the point is, if the flood is, the Bible clearly says in Genesis seven that the um, that it's above the highest mountain tops. The flood went above the highest mountain tops, and in that case, you're going to get overflow. It's not going to be a local flood anymore. <laughs> And if this, if one of these is the highest mountain tops and it's above it, so kind of simple, just thinking about it, you think, ah, oh, can't really be local. But I, I, I don't know if you've got any more questions about that. There's a lot of questions about the flood. I mean, we yeah. have books, um, we have whole books on it. <laughs> sure. It's like a whole book on just just on flood questions. But there's a lot of questions about the flood. But there's lots of good answers. If it's covered the highest mountains. 
then it's kind of saying, oh, this is a, a global flood. And it says the water's covered the whole earth. Um, I mean, it plainly says that a, a number of times. Um, but yeah, there's when you need to compromise, you try and say, okay, there was a there was a local flood. I think uh, we also have a YouTube channel. Look up Creation Ministries oh. International. There's a lot of YouTube videos there that are they're quite useful. And Instagram as well, Facebook, all these kind of things. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah I mean, there, there's there's so many creation uh, uh, websites yeah, out there. A lot of good yeah. resources. Creation, there. Yeah. 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 Creation Ministries ones. International. Uh, Edinburgh Creation Group. I think that's also one of the uh, um, one of the great uh, web, uh, sources out there that uh, you can look at. And someone goes in depth more into the names and the, uh, uh, what happened, during, especially during the, uh, especially the Table of Nations. I think you're aware of that, sir, right? There's, I think that's one of the most boring chapters in the Bible, uh, where uh, so and so begets so and so begets so and so. That's how uh, all the nations um, develop, uh, continuing yeah. us to the Tower of Babel. Yeah, okay. I mean, uh, we can discuss we can discuss a whole lot of things about Genesis. Uh, and, uh, yeah, Genesis one to eleven. There's a lot in there. So I'd say, uh, so a lot of people will recognize Genesis 1 to 11 is quite different to Genesis um, 12 through the end. I think it's 31 or something like that. So Genesis 1 to 11, you've got um, the creation of the world. The dispersing of the nations. So there's a lot of significant world events geologically, uh, population-wise, um, where the nations come from. I mean, that, that's an amazing thing. You're talking about the table of nations and you think it does look quite boring when you just read it. Oh, so-and-so have got so-and-so. But when you think about it, this is, um, this is, and it talks about the lands that they went to. Some went to Egypt, some went to Asia, some went north and south. And so you see where all the people groups in the world um, you can see where they went to. And in fact, there's some uh, creation geneticists that are now looking at um, the genomes of different um, ethnic groups and plotting them back, um, as the Bible says. And even, have you heard of uh, Y chromosome Adam and mitochondrial Eve? Have you heard of that? So there's this co popular concept now, and it's pretty much accepted by most geneticists, is that we all are males descended from one man and all females descended from one woman. And we can look at the mitochondrial DNA, which is only passed down from a mother to daughter, mother to daughter, mother to daughter. And therefore it doesn't, you don't get this recombination. So usually in the, in our, the main part of our genes, um, not the Y chromosome in Adam, but in all of our other, um, in our, 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 ge our genome is a cross between our mother and our father, right? And so every generation you get this mix, it's very hard to track back. But looking at the mitochondrial DNA and the Y chromosome only gets passed down father to son, father to son, you track back and you find that actually there's just one man, one woman. Um, just a quick interesting thing is the man will be uh, Noah because there was one Y chromosome on the ship. Um, but the that's really interesting because um, you can see that our, our genomes are very similar. We've, we're 99.9 .9 or 99.8 percent similar to everyone on the earth. And so really the Bible has the answer to racism there as well because you know, it's saying that actually we're all from one blood. <laughs> we're all descendants um, of Adam. Uh, we're all descendants of the uh, the eight people that were on the ark. Uh, yeah, right. Sorry, uh, I didn't quite answer your yeah, question. Yeah. I went, went, went a bit off. Yes, yes. Uh, what you answered is the first part of my question, which is table of nations. But now, sir, yeah, uh, yeah we we can discuss a lot of things. Supernatural creation about Genesis, you know, uh, supernatural creation, flood of Noah, and the table of nations. But uh, uh, to repeat the last part of my question, how can we relate this now to the person of Christ? How can how um, it's true that uh, for us to be saved, we need faith in Christ. But uh, why should we also why should we also give account, or why should we also consider the Genesis account, the Genesis history? Okay, how yeah. will this affect how will this affect the Christian? Uh, in terms of faith in Christ, does that's, that's it have a significance there? So how can we move direct these facts now to the person of Christ? Yeah, yeah. So look, this is the, there's a few things that I could say, because, you know, the Bible is, the Bible is like a hyperlinked book. Now, I don't know if we still use that word hyperlinked. <laughs> when the internet first came out, it was all about hyperlinks. But the Bible is a hyperlinked book. It is so linked. There's cross-references everywhere. Um, and if, I don't know if you've ever seen one of those diagrams where they, put the links between each book um, there's there's over a hundred references to genesis in the new testament 
And a lot of them are in Genesis 1 to 11. So, and a lot of them, so Jesus quotes things. He says <laughs> things like, um, from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. When God's defining marriage, he quotes Genesis. And so, you know, that's not the Big Bang story. The Big Bang story is, or the evolution story is, after 13.8 billion years, humans evolved. But Jesus says, from the beginning, God created male and female. Um, so anyway, there's a lot of links that are directly linked to what Jesus says, Jesus's theology, Paul's theology. There's a lot of links to Genesis. And we can't just break those links. Those links need to be there because that's how, what we're being presented. But the most important thing about how Genesis affects uh, what we think about Jesus and what he's done is if we try to take a long age or a theistic evolution point of view of Genesis, we actually remove the need for Jesus to go to the cross. We say that Jesus went to the cross. He didn't need to go. He didn't need to die. And you think that's really not a good thing of God to do, to send his one and only mm. son to the cross when he didn't really need to die. And I'll, I'll explain this now, Carl. So if you think about, I want you to think about a geological column. So it's the ground below our feet. There's a lot of fossils underneath the ground, right? And those fossils are dead. And even in those fossils, we have cancer, we have arthritis, thorns and thistles. Now, if he's trying to say, OK, there were millions of years, there were billions of years before Adam and Eve, before they existed. then what you're saying is all of these fossils below your feet happened before Adam and Eve. So what you're saying is that all this death came before Adam and Eve. So there's a problem mm -hmm. there because... What does the Bible say? Does the Bible say death came first or sin came first? It says that death is a result of sin. Therefore, sin has to come first and death come in. But if you take a theistic evolution point of view, if you take a progressive creation view, if you take a long age view, what you're saying is you're saying death came before sin. Death came before Adam. OK, so that but the, if you think about Genesis three, the curse, God says, you know, it's going to be hard for you to work. The ground's not going to produce fruit. There's going to be thorns and thistles. And finally, the most important thing is Genesis three nineteen: for to dust you shall return. The most important thing about the curse is that we die. We were not made to die. God said his good creation was very good. And in fact, we're going to have eternal life because God wants us wants it to be that way. But what happened was sin brought about death. Romans 5, 12 says this, um, says it in 1 Corinthians 15, 21 to 22 as well. Adam was the first, the first Adam brought death. The second Adam brought life. So it was Adam came first, Adam and Eve. They sinned and they brought death. Now, if you believe in theistic evolution, long age, you're saying death came before Adam. Therefore, when Adam sinned, God said, okay, to dust you shall return. Adam could have said, oh, it doesn't really matter. I'm going to die anyway. <laughs> You know, death's already in the world. I'm going to die. But that wasn't true. Death was not in the world at that point. There was no um, death of nefesh kaya, of breathing, um, of living, of, of animals and humans that had the breath of life and the spirit in them. Um, so what happens then is why did Jesus die on the cross? Jesus died yeah. on the cross to take away our sin, that the, that the sin of Adam, which we'd inherited and we therefore did, would be taken away. Therefore, we could have eternal life. But if the result of sin is not death, if you're saying to me, because if you're taking a long age or a theistic evolution point of view, you're, you're saying to me, death is not the result of sin. You're saying death is a normal and natural process that God made. Now, really, that wipes away the goodness of God as well. The theology of the goodness of God, God is not good anymore, if you think that. Because <laughs> death is, as long as you think death's bad, what does the New Testament say? It says death is the last enemy. It's the final enemy to be defeated. Death is definitely the enemy. We're all yeah. sad when yeah. people die. It's horrible. When someone close to us dies, it's the worst thing. And when we think about our own death, it's, it's, it's the final enemy. But what you're saying, if you're a long age, long age view, theistic evolution, progressive creation, you're saying death is not the enemy. You're saying death is a normal and natural thing that God has always been here, uh, that God used through the process of evolution, because you say God used evolution. But the problem then is, why did Jesus come? Jesus died on the cross, suffered to pay the penalty of death. The penalty of sin. So what penalty did, did he pay if sin, if there wasn't really a penalty? So what I'm saying here is that the gospel, the foundation of the gospel is creation, is Genesis. The foundation of the gospel is the fall. Where's the fall? The fall is found in Genesis 3. So the fall is when Adam and Eve sinned. 
And if there's no fall, there's no salvation. Why? There's no need for salvation. So this is why it's important theologically. This is why it's important to the message of the gospel. This is why Jesus came to undo the chains of death that bind us. As soon as we're born, we're born into the bloodline of Adam. As soon as we're born, mm. we have a sentence of death on our heads because we're born into the bloodline. There's need for us to be born again into a new bloodline, out of the line of Adam, into the line of Jesus. Um, but yeah, you know, with theistic evolution, there's no, well, you're going to die. Like that's the way God created it. And it's conf uh, confusing. So you could, ask, I think it's a good question to ask your theistic evolution friends like, okay, why did Jesus die? Right? And they will say something like spiritual death is quite complicated. It's convoluted. It's not, death is not the enemy to them. Yeah. Th thanks, Carl. Thanks for your time. And thanks for having us on. And thanks for thinking about things. And thank you for pursuing Christ um, more than anything. And I think as we pursue him, it says that the Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth. Um, and that he will remind us of the things that Jesus said. And really, we, uh, we're not lost at sea. There's a lot of different ideas out there, but we have the word of God. We have the spirit of God, and he, he can lead us into all truth. And, and I'd want to encourage people that are listening. Um, uh, yeah, to take the Bible as, as your precept, as the inerrant and infallible word of God. Take uh, the supernatural creation of the world and everything as your presupposition and then start investigating the world. This is the only kind of solid foundation that makes sense of the things we see around us. To, the only kind of worldview that is consistent throughout is the biblical worldview. Um, and that there's a lot of compromise, and even within the church, there's been a lot of capitulation to evolution. But I want to encourage people that are listening. So you can stand strong on the plain meaning of the word of God. There's no um, there are a lot of scientists that will tell you otherwise, but there's no science, no experimental verifiable science that can show you that this is incorrect. Um, you you've no reason to doubt what's written there. And I'd love you to take that. And yeah, if you want to stay in touch with us, well, if, if you want to find out more, I would just really recommend our website is creation.com. Now there's 15,000 articles on there and there's a search box. So if you've got a theological question or a scientific question, instead of using Google, use that because then you get a biblical worldview. There's literally, I'm 15, or it might be 13,000, some, somewhere between there, 13 and 15,000 articles. But there's a lot of articles. So you can type in any question um, there. I would say that's a great, great resource. Yeah, we've got, check us out on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook. We've got all those things. Um, this is a great book. I buy a lot of these books at a time. <laughs> it's a book. Okay. And because I, I give them to people, uh, it's called the creation wow. answer. And so there's 60 of the most common questions. So I find whenever I um, go evangelizing on the streets, um, the young people, the kind of questions they ask, they ask, who did Cain marry? They ask, what about dinosaurs? <laughs> they ask, what about yeah. alien life? They ask, um, what about the population? Uh, what about the ape men? Um, what about evolution? They, these are the questions the young people on the street ask. Now in church, we have lots of debates about it, but actually when you get out there and you start preaching the gospel, the questions are all these type of questions and they're all in here basically. So we've got loads of books, but this is one that's got all the um, basic, uh, basic questions in. So that, that, that's a great one. I, I'm pretty, I'm, yeah, I'm not sure how you get it. I think you'd go to our website and buy it there. Uh, did they sell it in Amazon also, sir? Uh, maybe actually on our website you can get the digital version for free you can download each oh, chapter okay. yeah um and so, so that's a really good way to get instant access to it we thank, i thank think you. we sell it quite cheap we're a non-profit so we're not we're not trying to make profit off these things so so if you want the physical book you can order it but there's the digital copies free you just go to our website and and you can download each chapter so that that's if you're like really interested in finding out all the answers to these questions quickly that's probably the best way um our inst check out our Instagram. Like it's so, you know, if you just want to learn just by flicking through things, <laughs> that's a that's a way. It takes a lot of thinking to concise down to or to make all of this information very concise. So a lot of effort goes into that. Yeah. Friends, thank you very much for watching. Please subscribe to our channel, The Fellowship League, and also please click the bell button to receive all of our valuable content in this channel in your notifications. Moreover, we have a Fellowship League page, Facebook page. Please do like and follow and share this page to your friends and families and loved ones who need the encouragement, the facts, the cross, and discourses. Fun filled with comfort, with uh, intellectual facts and factual discussions for you guys. Thank you very much and God bless you all.